we'll have Paris. We have about two minutes, so. We you like host Alex. Wire here at WTTW, Alex. Say it again. You like to bring it down to the wire here. At yeah, I know. I'm a little sweaty. <laughs> Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to sign off so you don't have me on the show. <laughs> that would be fun, wouldn't it? Um, have a great show. Thank you. Have Thank fun. You. See you Bye. soon. Bye. get into position yet. Yeah. Good evening and welcome to the Week in Review. I'm Paris Schutz. I'll be joined by our Week in Review guests for our regular show in just a moment. But first, some of today's top stories. Charges today in a shooting incident that injured three police officers, one very seriously yesterday outside a Northwest Side police station. 25-year-old Lavelle Jordan is charged with six counts of attempted murder of a police officer after allegedly opening fire while he was being taken into custody on carjacking charges. Now, the police department says the officer who was seriously injured has bullet fragments in his neck and is in a medically induced coma. Jordan himself was taken to the hospital after the incident and is reportedly paralyzed from the chest down. CPD's chief of detectives says that suspect had recently been in jail on gun charges. Where he just got uh, released uh, being on parole was for felony possession of a gun. Uh, he was on electronic monitoring until June and then that was removed, and then it's not a month later that he's armed with a gun, going into a stolen car with officers five feet away from him, and then which leads to him shooting officers. Meanwhile, Police Superintendent David Brown was on hand in back of the yards this afternoon to launch the new community safety team. That initiative is meant to bring services to neighborhoods while also giving community members a safe place to be outside in order to recreate. A third Columbus statue comes down temporarily. City crews removed the statue that used to stand right here at 92nd and Exchange in the South Chicago neighborhood. It's part of an effort to bring the monuments down for the time being so that protesters don't pull them down in an unsafe manner. The mayor has promised a dialogue on what to do about controversial monuments like this one and two other Columbus statues, one in Little Italy and one in Grand Park, that were brought down last week. Illinois' COVID numbers are going up again. Public health officials announced 1,941 new confirmed cases for a statewide total of more than 178,000. And there were 21 additional deaths reported for a total death toll of 7,495. Meanwhile, the seven-day positivity rate has inched up to 3.9%. The Department of Public Health also announces 11 downstate Illinois counties are at a warning level for rising COVID-19 cases based on factors like new cases per 100,000, ICU availability, and weekly test positivity. No counties in the Chicago metropolitan area are on that list. 
And now joining us from various locations around town are Mary Mitchell of the Chicago Sun-Times, Greg Pratt of the Chicago Tribune, Dan Mihalopoulos of WBEZ, and our very own Heather Sharon of WTTW News. And let's get right to the top stories of the day. Governor J.B. Pritzker warned that the state's number of COVID-19 cases was going in the wrong direction. Let's take a look at what he had to say about it. We do not want the state or any region in the state moving backward. So I'm imploring people to follow the guidelines, to follow the mitigations that we've put forward, do everything they can, and that way we won't have to move any region backward. You know, but I would say that we're at a danger point, everybody. Pay attention. Danger point. Heather Sharon, does that mean the state is on the precipice of another stay at home order akin to what it saw starting in March? I don't think so. So the governor, um, after he lifted the stay at home order, created eight Illinois regions, and he has said that he will address increases region by region. So right now, the hot spots in Illinois are really in southern Illinois, especially along the Missouri Illinois border and the Illinois Kentucky border. So I would expect that unless things start to turn around, those are the counties or the regions that will see the first rollbacks take effect. But let's not forget, We've already had rollbacks in Chicago. Mayor Lori Lightfoot closed indoor service at bars that don't have food retail li food licenses. So we will see, I think, rather than another stay at home order, we're going to see targeted attempts to reduce the spread of the virus, which is really being spread now by young people, not social distancing and not wearing masks. Also part of the restrictions, Mary Mitchell, are self-quarantine for 14 days for anyone coming here from about 22 states. So starting today, those states include Wisconsin. Do you think that folks are going to heed those orders, especially coming from Wisconsin? No, I do not think so. I, I don't think they will heed them any more than, you know, Chicagoans heeded stay-at-home orders when they wanted to go off to run off to Indiana or Michigan uh, to recreate. I think that's a very, very hard thing to do unless you set a roadblocks and uh, checkpoints and to see who's coming and who's going, it, that's really hard to enforce. I think, th but what it does do is send a message that this is serious folks and that we need to make sure that we are doing what we're supposed to do as citizens to protect ourselves. At the same time, CPS parents have about a week to decide whether or not they're gonna opt out of the sort of uh, hybrid learning model that CPS announced that uh, Dan Mihalopoulos do you think that if cases keep going up, CPS might just decide to go all virtual? Yeah, they've said that uh, that's a possibility. If the number of cases keep rising uh, to a certain number, the seven day rolling average is what we're looking at. Although we had a high number uh, today, the highest in, in quite a while across the state. I think they're looking as, as Heather said, more regionally. But again, um, we had a, a big decline in cases when uh, the restrictions were much more severe, restrictions were loosened a little bit. And now not only CPS, but a lot of the suburban districts too, that were saying that they were gonna open, starting to track back now one by one, looking at virtual models, looking at hybrid models. Uh, and I know a number of suburban districts have already said kids won't be uh, there. They'll be remote learning until at least some point in October. Greg Pratt, how will this play out with the Chicago Teachers Union, which has sort of hinted that they might take some kind of action if in-person classes do resume and their teachers are put at risk? Well, it's, it's nowhere near out of the realm of possibility that we may have another teacher strike on our hands. That's a very real possibility. It's something that everybody probably doesn't want to talk about or think about because in a year as crazy as this one, that's probably the last thing we need. But the teachers union has very serious, significant concerns that you see them talk about every day and that you can imagine playing out uh, as another strike. Heather, uh, you know what I, yeah, go ahead, Mary, yeah, but, go ahead. Yeah, but the thing that, that, that bothers me or concerns me is that while we're talking about a hybrid model and we're talking about virtual learning, they haven't caught up to the kids who dropped out and dropped out of sight during the first go round when school, when the, when the uh, pandemic first hit and they went to virtual learning, they lost thousands of children. They haven't heard from them. You know, there, there are kids who are homeless that, that were not able to access those types of, of, of learning. So I think that, that instead of talking about, you know, when they're getting back in the classroom, instead of CTU being worried about that, they ought to be worried about how do we help those children 
who may not have any way to, to do remote learning. Heather, can they account for all CPS children and do they have the technology figured out where everybody does have access to at least a tablet or some kind of laptop to do virtual learning? They haven't been able to reach every student. There are some schools that did a better job at that than others, but this Mary's right. This is a real area of concern because even though the district used millions of dollars in federal relief aid to purchase tablets and computers and hotspots, there are still students who don't have access and won't have access. And that is partly behind Mayor Lori Lightfoot's push to at least offer some in-person schooling because she recognizes is that even though even the students that were reached, many of them remote learning was not very successful right. on top of the students that weren't reached at all. So there's really no good solution to this until the pandemic is under control. And, and it's clear, like Dan said today, uh, we've seen the, some of the highest case numbers so far after the stay at home order was lifted, uh, which I think should give a lot of people a lot of concern about whether uh, any of this is going to be possible. Certainly consistently going in that direction. Dan Mihal also, also this week, we had the, the tragic apparent suicide of a, a, a deputy um, in the Chicago Police Department, Dion Boyd. You know, a few years ago, the Department of Justice had shown that the Chicago Police Department had a real problem with suicides more than the average police department. How is the police department doing in terms of mental health treatment for, for its, its uh, members? Yeah, it's a really big problem for the Chicago Police Department, perhaps far worse uh, than it is for police around the country. Um, we had a story earlier this year on WBZ focused on just that fact that you brought up that the suicide rate could be 60% higher in CPD than it is for law enforcement nationally. Uh, so we have this image of the, the Chicago Police Department amid all the criticism that they're getting, much of it uh, justified, no doubt, uh, of defiance. We see the union being defiant. We see certain officers gathering around the Statue of Columbus, mostly what I would call white ethnic officers, uh, and being very defiant to people who are critics of the Chicago Police Department and the excessive use of force that's been documented in the department since practically forever. Uh, at the same time, there are other uh, officers who clearly are suffering much more silently and then manifesting itself in this uh, horrible um, rash of suicides that we see uh, even among a high ranking uh, police brass. It's always a high stress job made tougher now because of the civil unrest and COVID-19. And it happened at this home and square uh, police facility in North Lawndale. You know, there was a there was an article from the British based Guardian calling home and square a black site. Does anyone want to kind right. of weigh in on the controversy uh, around this facility that this apparent suicide happened? Well, it's certainly been a facility that's been targeted by activists in recent weeks, and it has been a flash of controversy, even though the police department has dismissed those claims as overblown and not verified. Uh, but, you know, again, I, I don't think we can emphasize enough about what a serious problem sort of mental health services for the uh, Chicago Police Department is. We had David Brown on our show this week, and uh, Carol Marina asked him if he had ever sought professional help, and he said that he hadn't. Hmm. And I got to say, I thought that was an interesting thing for him to say when you want to set a tone at the top, uh, something more has to be done to normalize mental health treatment for officers who are under so much stress. There can be a stigma for a lot of people, but especially for police officers. Uh, Greg Pratt, you also had the unfortunate situation this week of uh, a, a man taken into custody who had a gun on his person and shot at police officers and seriously injuring one who's in a medically induced coma. Do we know how how this man was able to have uh, to be armed while he was being taken into custody for a carjacking. Well, that's a horrible uh, that's a horrible situation and a really um, awkward and unfortunate series of events where the guy was able to hide his gun even after being searched in his uh, groin region and was able to keep it concealed uh, despite a search. And you know, he opens fire, tries to steal a car. People are hurt, and it's it's just a really bad situation that probably shouldn't have happened. And our thoughts, yeah. of course, are with 
that police officer who no who is in, in serious condition right now at the hospital. All right, let's move on to some other politics. Speaker Michael Madigan, also known as Public Official A, has no plans to turn over his gavel in the wake of the ComEd bribery scandal as the list of Democrats calling for him to step down as Speaker grows. Meanwhile, ComEd executives make an apology tour as policymakers weigh new ethics reforms. And the pushback is bipartisan after President Trump muses about delaying the November election on Twitter. Dan Milopoulos, you've been following this story for a long time. Mike Madigan says he did nothing wrong. He called a bunch of members, and he's not going anywhere. Is that the end of it? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, he's 78 years old. Uh, he's got millions and millions of dollars in campaign funds and various funds, the head of the state Democratic Party, as well as being the uh, Speaker of the Illinois House for all but two years since 1983. He's, his political career has outlived the political career of his daughter. And uh, he doesn't have any uh, indication that he's looking uh, to leave uh, personal finance wise, forget about his pension. I mean, he's probably made gobs and gobs of money as a property tax appeal lawyer for some of the biggest buildings uh, in Chicago and in the Chicago area. What is his end game? I, I think only he knows, but right now he's facing more pressure. Uh, you would almost never hear a, a peep out of anyone in, uh, in Springfield against Mike Madigan until now, but the federal uh, heat that's on him is like nothing he's seen before. And you do hear more than a peep right now. So we've counted eight uh, Democrats in the House and Senate in Springfield that have spoken out, calling on him to step down either as party chairman, Speaker of the House, state rep, or all of them, as you look at them right there. Seven of, seven of those eight are women. And then today there was uh, Jonathan Yoni Pizer, uh, state representative. You know, if, as I look at most of these folks, uh, they, it's safer for them politically to come out against Speaker Madigan. Uh, they're not as beholden to him as so many other Democrats in the House. Mary Mitchell, do you expect more House Democrats to come forward, even though so many of them owe their careers to Mike Madigan? Well, first of all, I don't know how they could not. I, don't, I cannot see him surviving this type of scrutiny. What really strikes me is that now we're not looking at just at Michael Madigan. We know his, he's been around for a long time, and we know what his end game probably will be. He'll probably get to resign and ride off into the sunset. <laughs> but the whole issue of the lobbying issue, that he was able, they were, Tom Ed was able to engage in this type of behavior with taxpayers' money, for God's sake. And nobody goes to jail. A fine is paid. Uh, Madigan gets to stay until he decides he wants to leave. It's, it's a disgrace. I mean, it's just something that we ought to, we, as, as, as residents of the state, we ought to be totally shocked and ashamed by. Yeah, yeah. Madigan, uh, the ComEd, of course, gets to pay that $200 million deferred prosecution fine in exchange for basically admitting to the, this years-long bribery scheme. Greg Pratt, what do you think it takes for more Democrats to call for Madigan to step down? Because right now, they kind of echo the governor saying, well, if this is true and we need to hear more. Well, they're going to keep, it's going to trickle out. There's going to be a slow drumbeat of people uh, deciding that they're going to speak out against him. But really the, the tipping point is going to be if he gets indicted and you know, the feds clearly declared war on him when they uh, unveiled their deferred prosecution agreement. And I guess we'll see where their investigation, which they described as vibrant, takes them. It, it's no it's no question the way that U.S. Attorney John Lausch spoke. He wants people to come forward. Dan Mihalopoulos, it seems to be that whether or not Madigan gets indicted hinges on whether people are going to flip. People like top advisor Mike McClain, who himself is under investigation. Do you think some of these folks would flip? Well, you mentioned Mike McClain. He was both a lo top lobbyist for ComEd and uh, the closest confidant for Mike Madigan for many decades. Uh, we talked to him earlier this year. Uh, my colleague Dave McKinney and I met him outside of a steakhouse in downtown Chicago and uh, approached him. He said that the feds had asked him to cooperate. He is sort of the linchpin to this bribery scheme that ComEd perpetrated in order to win influence with Mike Madigan. Uh, but McLean indicated at that time that he wasn't likely to cooperate, that he felt it would be not only a betrayal of Madigan, but a betrayal to his own self if he were to cooperate with the feds. And we know this is very ingrained in Chicago and Illinois politics, this idea that if you go and tell the truth to the feds, 
you're a rat, a beefer. There's all sorts of uh, euphemisms for for someone that cooperates with the government against uh, someone like Mike Madigan, who's made them very rich. I mean, and how many wonder- how many people didn't say a word uh, and went to jail for former Mayor Richard M. Daley, like uh, Robert Sorich and uh, other folks like that? Mary, were you about to jump in there? I, I was. I was just getting ready to say, and then we wonder why. We cannot have, we cannot solve these terrible murders and crimes that go on in Chicago. Because really, the people at the top, the leaders have, have engaged in behavior that says, they're a rat, or you can't snitch on somebody, you can't tell, or you can't cooperate. Well, if, that, if the, the top leaders and the, the top politicians won't cooperate, what makes you think that people uh, in these gangs and in these involved in these street murders, that they're going to cooperate? So it's almost Just like a no-snitch policy that pervades uh, street life, also pervades political life. Heather Sharon, Governor Pritzker, saying Madigan needs to speak more. He needs to tell us all more about all of this. What exactly does Pritzker want Madigan to tell us? Well, we heard a little bit of a different tone from the governor today on Friday when asked what he thought about the growing calls for Madigan's resignation. And instead of saying that he should resign only if it was true, Pritzker instead said, you know, we need to have Michael Madigan answer these questions and speak to the people of Illinois and sort of, you know, be held to account for what this deferred prosecution agreement alleges that he did. That, you know, that, that I think is in no small part tied to the growing sense that some Democrats fear that the fate of Pritzker's progressive income tax, which is on the November ballot, which is coming up faster than any of us can really comprehend, is really tied to the sense of whether, you know, Springfield can be trusted with additional tax money. And I think that you may see these calls start to grow if that sense that this sort of crucial, as Pritzker says, uh, effort is endangered by by this scandal, which, as Greg said, has the potential to trickle out a little bit as a t- at a time as we get closer to Election Day. All right, now let's see if we can all follow this one. So this week, the Illinois Commerce Commission that oversees utility rates had a meeting to hear from ComEd. It was the first time representatives from the utility spoke since the bribery scheme involving jobs and contracts. The Friends of Speaker Madigan was revealed. So who chairs the ICC? Well, that's Kerry Zalewski. According to federal prosecutors, Zalewski's father-in-law, former 23rd Ward Alderman Michael Zalewski, benefited from this scandal. Carrie Zalewski refused to recuse herself. Dan Milopoulos, is this a giant conflict of interest here, or as Ms. Zalewski has said, well, she, she shouldn't be guilty by implication. She, hasn't, she is not implicated in anything. Well, guilty she, by association, I mean. Right. She refused to talk to... Uh, me and another reporter who actually attended the ICC meeting the other day in person, you know, the ComEd officials come in, and here is Carrie Zaleski asking them about a bunch of questions about this bribery scheme that the company is admitted to, and the 500-pound uh, uh, gorilla in the room that everyone is ignoring is that one of the beneficiaries, one of the subcontractors who was hired at the behest of Mike Madigan, according to all these court documents, was her father-in-law. Beyond that, you know, she was recommended to J.B. Pritzker for the ICC. Mike Madigan has clouded for her at least twice to J.B. Pritzker to put her on the ICC and her previous state job. And so here she is as the top state regulator over this company enmeshed in this huge scandal uh, for what they did vis-a-vis Mike Madigan. And she's Madigan's person at the ICC. You would think that that would be a blatant conflict of interest, but she says it isn't, and everything went on as if this were business as usual at the Illinois Commerce Commission. Again, they're the regulator of the utilities in this state. ComEd is the biggest one of those regulators, and here she is with uh, personal ties to the scandal through her family, granted. She says she's done nothing wrong herself. And Carrie Zaleski, of course, is uh, married to Mike Zaleski, Junior, who is a state representative, the son of Mike Zaleski, the former alderman, who is, uh, has, has been implicated in some of this. Heather, ComEd did get raked over the coals a little bit by city council in a hearing this week, although city council kind of, uh, the mayor came back with a study saying, you know, you know if we're going to have the city take over this utility from ComEd, it's really not going to work. So it seems like ComEd is really, it's not going to face much recourse, at least from the city perspective. 
I think that's probably where things stand right now. It would cost the city somewhere between $5 billion and $10 billion to take over ComEd, uh, not to mention that it would be very difficult and the city would have to figure out how to run an electric utility in addition to doing everything else. So that that possibility got more remote uh, since there is a feasibility study that nobody has seen yet that apparently says it's not feasible. But ComEd did face a number of point questions from aldermen that said, look, it, it's not going to be enough for you to sit here and say you're deeply sorry, like CEO Joe Dominguez said, we actually have to see sort of actions. So it's far more likely at this point anyway that the city will use this scandal to sort of increase its leverage on ComEd uh, and ask for things like stronger sustainable energy goals, perhaps more rate forgiveness for poor and low income Chicagoans and other things along those along those, you know, on along those lines. But uh, it seems unlikely that ComEd would lose the Chicago Franchise Agreement, which if they did, would be nearly a death blow to them since most of their customers are in Northern Illinois. And of course, most people in Illinois, in Northern Illinois, live in Chicago. Right, and Greg Pratt, uh, what about um, you know some of these lawsuits seeking uh, a redress uh, of, of some of these higher power utility fees that, the, that residents have paid? Uh, allegedly because of this bribery. I mean, will ComEd give users a break here? Well, not not unless somebody makes them, no. You know, that's 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 no no company, and certainly not a company that is as big as ComEd and has been implicated in the bribery scheme is gonna willingly give stuff away unless they have to. So I guess we'll see what the courts decide on that. All right, let's talk to, about some national politics. You know, the president, uh, you know, floated the idea of delaying the election, which he can't do. He got rebuked on both sides of the aisle. Uh, Republicans dismissed that idea as well as Democrats. Continues to foment distrust here in mail-in balloting. Wants to wants the American public perhaps not to trust the results of the election if it's not good for him. Mary Mitchell, do you think this will have an impact on voters and their faith in in this democracy and in this election? I think what will have an impact on voters when it comes to mail-in voting will be how they're getting their mail right now. And I think that that has been uh, a big concern from in some communities where people have complained they didn't get their mail for two weeks or their mail has just been uh, uh, random and sporadic. So I think that that will have more of an impact on it than, than uh, President Trump. Uh, claiming that we need to delay the election. I, I think people can see through that as a, a way for him to uh, try to make sure that uh, he slowed down the momentum of Joe Biden. And Demi Halopoulos, speaking of Joe Biden, we're supposed to know his vice presidential pick next week. How uh, likely is it that that will be Tammy Duckworth? Well, she was uh, moving up the charts a while ago, and uh, the, the conventional wisdom in the beltway at least seems to have uh, placed her a little bit further down the list, perhaps. Uh, but I think that she's in a good position to be in a prominent role in the next administration, whether she's vice president or maybe in a cabinet role. I'm not sure what she would want uh, alternatively, um, but you know, she has certainly um, seen her profile raised considerably with her uh, Twitter battles with the president, with her other comments about the president. And, and certainly she brings to the table the fact that she's a veteran uh, against someone who refused uh, essentially to fight uh, when he had the opportunity and not only is a veteran but one who was wounded uh, very gravely uh, in the line of duty for this country. And we, we all know that story. All right, that's where we're going to have to leave it. My thanks to all of you, Mary Mitchell, Greg Pratt, Dan Mihalopoulos, and Heather Sharon. Thanks so much for joining us. And that is our show for this Friday night. Join us next week live at 7. Now for the Week in Review, I'm Paris Schutz. Thank you so much for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and have a great weekend. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm whose pro bono work kept open a church shelter for the homeless in Chicago's southern suburbs.